Okay, so welcome to Premier Education, and I am so happy and so excited to have Ryan Miley uh, join us tonight to talk about education. Yeah, great to be here, Adam. Thanks for inviting me on. And I know you have a busy schedule, so it's, I'm so glad you were able to, to set aside that time. I, uh, I would like to say that thanks for everybody tuning in live as well. As we go through this, we want to engage you as much as we possibly can. So click on the like button, but most importantly, put your comments below and we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. So put your comments in and, and we'll, we'll, take, we'll take some of those questions as we go along. Uh, my name is Adam Hicks and I'm, with the, I'm a trustee on the Regina School Board at, in Regina here. And a little disclaimer is the views expressed in here are solely my, my own and not those of the board. So. With that, I have a little bit of research I did on Ryan. So I, I want to give you, the audience, a, a little bit about this. So Ryan is a leadership candidate, uh, uh, one of two, for the NDP party. And coming up very soon, you will have a chance to vote for your next leader of the NDP party. Uh, with that, Ryan is actually a family doctor. So when I told some friends we were doing this with Ryan, they gave me a list of things I should ask about back pain, and, and, but we're sticking solely to, solely to education there today. no examination. So. <laughs> I'm glad there's no, yeah, there's no gloves you brought along, so that's, that's a great thing. Um, one thing I, I didn't know, you, uh, your elementary year in Coder? Kod Kader. 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 Yeah. I didn't know how to pronounce that. Yeah, that's that's uh, about halfway between Musha and Gravelberg. I grew up on a farm outside a town called Kerval and took the bus into Kader was there until grade seven. Kader, cool. Well then I know you took middle years in, in high school in, in Moose Jaw and then you went on to the U of S to get your your doctor medicine yeah. medicine yeah. degree I guess. Yeah, medical degree. Medical yeah. degree. Yeah. yeah. So you've been an MLA in Saskatoon and uh, you've been involved with the NDP for, for twenty some years I found on on the online. Was it I know it's. I'm, I don't think I'm quite old enough to have been involved for twenty some years, but uh, yeah. Maybe it's getting up there. It's getting to be about twenty years since I since I first got involved. That's about right. Yeah. yeah cool. Um, with co little uh, little fun fact here is I'm I'm gonna I found some things. So like everybody else, I went through all your Facebook posts. and You had a lot. I have we have a screen here. I'm gonna show. So can we bring up the screen? So I was excited to see that you actually have done a TEDx talk. A healthy society, which is really, really neat. You have over 5,000 followers on Facebook, which is impressive. And as you can see on the screen, 7,000 followers on Twitter, which is absolutely amazing. So, what we have, I, I wanted to say that uh, your social influence is uh, is very impressive, and uh, I I was impressed when I was looking through that. Yeah, well, like you're doing here tonight, engaging with people on social media, I think it's a really important way for us to, to get ideas out there, to have a chance to share what I think, and more importantly, people to reach me and, and feedback their ideas. Yeah. Well, you have a lot of posts, and I, I can see you engaging a lot, so that's, that's nice to see. Okay, so we have a prepared question here, and like, like everybody else, I asked my son what he would ask you. So we have a, a, a funny little, little question here from my son. Hi, my name is Corbin Hicks. I'm in grade two, and I go to Massey School. My question is: Can is is it home time yet? <laughs> so, is it home time yet? That's the question. <laughs> How old's your son? Uh, he's seven, seven years oh, very old. Very nice. Uh, my son Abraham is six, uh, oh, and okay. sort of uh, can see some similar mannerisms <laughs> and uh, and impatiences there. Um, it's getting to be uh, past home time now, it, it's probably bedtime, Corbin. What are you doing still up asking questions? And I thought it was an appropriate question for now because yes, he is going to bed right away All here. Right. So it's, it's getting a little late. But Okay, so we want to get to uh, and hit, hit the like button and stuff as you go through this. Keep the comments coming. We'll try to get to some of these comments as we go. So we have a first prepared question here. And the first one comes from Allie, who is an education student at the U of R. And let's see what Allie's question is. And I'm just wondering what your vision for the K-12 education is here in Saskatchewan. Okay, well thank you very much for the question, Ali. Really appreciate it. I always want to back up just a little bit and talk about the sort of larger vision for Saskatchewan that will then inform what I have to say about education. Coming as I do from the health field uh, and also just from, from what I've learned and thought about what it is that government is for, what it is that we're trying to achieve, what's our underlying philosophy, it all comes down to how do we build the healthiest society possible. 
And what really makes the big difference in health isn't the work that I and other doctors and other people in healthcare do. It's actually whether people have enough money, whether they have a decent place to stay, whether they have access to good food. And very key, one of the major determinants of health, we call those, is education. So if we want a healthy society, we have to have a high quality education. And I actually look at, I know you asked about K to 12, but I'll, I'll take us a little bit through the spectrum. We have to start at early childhood education. Those first thousand days actually make a huge difference in people's quality of life and the quality of experience they'll have in education, whether or not they'll be ready to succeed in K to 12. So having universal, affordable, uh, good quality early childhood learning is a big part of getting to great K to 12 learning. Once we're in the K to 12 system, you know, today's classrooms are, are certainly different. There are uh, big stressors on teachers, on students with uh, integrated classrooms that involve kids with special needs, kids with all different levels of ability, different languages as backgrounds. There's a lot that needs to be done to work to make the right mix of educational assistance, teachers, supports, to really be able to provide the kind of top quality education. Also means, and when I, when I look at what makes a big difference in a quality education, a lot of that comes down to equity. When we have a system that is meeting the needs of all students, it's more likely to actually succeed. Uh, and I'll, I'll take the example of a, as you know, any teacher yeah. who identifies in their classroom a student who's struggling, they're going to give that teacher a little bit of, or they're going to give that student a little bit of extra time, a little bit of extra support. The same needs to be true for how we design our system. So whether it's kids in rural schools or First Nations and Métis children or kids who are new to Canada, kids with special needs, or older children who, older students who have, uh, have kids of their own. How do we design a system that meets their needs, addresses the mental health challenges that children are facing today? If we do that right, we'll provide a high quality education that'll serve kids of all abilities. And lastly, I think to, in order to deliver that equitable, high quality, accessible system, we need a different relationship. We've seen over the last decade a SAS party that has been cutting funding, but even worse than cutting funding, cutting off the people who should have the greatest influence on our education system. Reducing the influence of boards and local communities, schools and their leadership, teachers, and students and communities themselves. So to have a really high quality education system, I think we need to rebuild that relationship and build it on a basis of respect and develop the kind of process where we bring together all of the key partners to design a, a quality system together rather than a top-down approach that's just coming from Regina. Yeah. Well, I, I, you hit on two things in there, more, more, uh, more engagement with school boards and community, which I appreciate, and, and even in your plan. So if you haven't seen uh, Ryan's plan yet, it's ryanmiley.com, and it's uh, investing upstream. So I read through this thing, and, and you hit on that early years piece, and I, I even found, uh, I remember the CBC study, or the CBC that highlighted the study that came out, that every dollar invested in early year education turns back, I believe it was four to six dollars in economic value afterwards. And, and so, so what is your strategy specifically around early years and, and that investment? Yeah, and that's exactly right. In the very short term, you get a, a quick return on investment just by the number of people who are now able to, with decent childcare, who are able to access the workforce. So when Quebec went to their seven dollar a day childcare program, yeah, they actually saw a dollar seventy back for every dollar they put in Really, within a couple of years to their income tax system, just from more people being in the workforce. Huh. Now that's the short term gain, the longer term gain, and I think it even goes beyond that four to six to up into the eight to ten dollars. When you look at the decreased health, social services, and justice yeah. costs when kids succeed in school, and the increased economic activity as they go on to be productive parts of uh, society. So there's the, that economic return, and bigger to me. It's, uh, dollars and cents is, is a good way of describing these values, but really what matters is these kids have better yeah, lives. Right? They, they, there's a great quote from a guy, Joel Westheimer, he's a researcher out of Ottawa, and he talked about the studies that show return of, on investment when you have school breakfast programs. Um, kids, uh, kids had better test scores. 
And he said, well, do we really need test scores to show that it's not okay <laughs> for kids to go to school hungry? It's no, it, it's a value of we want these kids to have great lives. And the best way to do that is actually to start early, making sure they have great opportunities. And Ryan, you make a good point in that it's, it's easy to go down that trail of numbers and facts and studies. Yeah. And, but yeah, it's, we're dealing with people and human right, and hearts. I've heard it the best is extri- described as it's not dealing with head counts or people. It's you're dealing with heart counts. And yeah. that's, anyways, that's something we can't lose focus of. So, so we, have a, right. we have a question here from Wendy. And Wendy has been active on this. So thank you, Wendy, for your participation in these okay. videos. Wendy says, we know that poverty and hunger affect how children learn. How would you ensure that these children are ready for school every day? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we saw the recent study that showed that one in four kids in Saskatchewan are living in poverty. The highest rates in the country. When you look at on-reserve poverty, that gets up over 50%. This is a, a gross injustice and really is, a, is something we need to focus on and change. Only Saskatchewan and BC don't have a poverty reduction strategy. Every other province has implemented one, and they've seen significant reductions in poverty as a result. BC's in the process of of designing one right now, um, and we need to do the same. A couple of years ago, I was asked by the provincial government to help design one. They invited me and other community leaders and people within the within the civil service to design a poverty really? reduction strategy, and we came up with a plan that would address housing, food security, and that could reduce the rate of poverty by 50% within five years. And we presented that to the provincial government and they took it, created a very watered down version with much less uh, stringent goals or ambitious goals and have done very little to enact it. So we know that poverty costs us nearly $4 billion a year to the economy. We also, and that's because of those increased health, social yeah. services, justice costs, decreased economic activity. And we know that living in poverty makes it harder to succeed. It makes it more likely you'll suffer from illness, that you'll ha- wind up with all kinds of complications in your life. And the earlier we deal with that, the better. But we have a government that hasn't chosen to do that. We need a government in place that has the political will to take poverty seriously and take action on it. So if you, if the NDP takes over and if you were the next premier, yep. would you implement that full plan? Is that what? I would implement that full plan. Yeah. I would uh, go back to that advisory group on poverty reduction and the, and the recommendations they put in place and I'd put those in place and maybe take it even a, a step further. I'm very interested in the idea of a universal basic income. I'm not yeah. sure if you've heard of a that little before. Bit, yeah. uh, it's basically the idea that uh, rather than giving people a, a very minimal amount when they're on social assistance and, and clawing that back if they make any extra yeah. money so we, we keep people trapped in poverty, that we actually give people enough to live on. And studies have shown when that was tried in Manitoba and other places that people actually got into the workforce more, got out of poverty and stayed out of poverty, and you saw a big decrease in health costs and other social costs. So that's an idea that's being explored hmm. with a pilot in Ontario. I'd oh, like I to have no idea, that here. actually. That's, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Wendy, great question. That, uh, that, that, yeah. That's an awesome question. If we want, I always talk about this. If we want good health outcomes, we need to deal with poverty. We need to deal with the social factors. The very same factors that influence whether people will be healthy or not are whether are what influence whether or not they'll be successful in school. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that sounds great. I love it. Uh, okay, we have two questions from the audience, but first we're going to go to a prepared question here. So this one comes from Jill, and Jill's actually a chair of our one of our local uh, school community councils. Oh, so Jill's question. The population of Saskatchewan is different today than it was even a few years ago and will continue to see it change in the years ahead. Demographically, what challenges do you anticipate for the K-12 education sector? What about economic challenges and what opportunities do you see? Thanks, Jill. Yeah, thank you, Jill. And as I alluded to a bit before, we have seen big changes in our classrooms. We are seeing the integration of classrooms, which I think is excellent. We've got much more diversity among the student body and having students with special needs or students who are um, coming from other countries who have English or French, uh, for that matter, in the francophone system as an additional language. That adds challenges. We also have more students per class. So that makes it a lot more difficult. 
we need to step back and say, how do we actually identify what the successful outcomes are? And, and I'm not moving us towards that model that we've drifted more and more towards, which is standardized testing and trying to make every kid fit one size. We actually need to be looking at the individualized, high quality evaluation and assessment and use that as a measure of how we allocate resources. If we're going to respond to the needs of kids, we have to do it by understanding from the point of view of teachers and the point of view of the kids themselves what the outcomes are we're trying to achieve and then direct our resources in the most equitable fashion to achieve the best outcomes. On a quick side note on that one, I, I know I hear as a trustee a lot on the PISA results. Yeah. And it's you hear both sides of the story about um, um, you need some type of measure, but also you don't want to put that pressure on kids and we're, we're teaching to life. We're not yeah. always teaching to a test and that's it's a tough balance. And that's it is a tough balance and I think where you really get into danger, you know, some we always had some kind of standardized testing yeah. which are helpful to give us some indication of where there might be a need for more resources. But where you get into real trouble is with this sort of test to reward, the no child left behind model out of the states where if you're, yeah, if you're doing I'm well on your test, you get more resources, yeah. which is actually the opposite the, of what we need. The, you focus on the wrong carrot at the end of the tree. Like and you, you actually end up creating more division yeah. and more inequity within your health, er, pardon me, within your <laughs> school system and eventually your health system. Fair enough. Some, no, some habits die hard. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so this question comes from Jamie. Jamie says, uh, and thanks Jamie for the question, what are your thoughts on graduate retention programs? So graduate retention programs are one of the places that the SAS party is really invested in in post-secondary education. And there, there can be value in that, um, but I, I think we need to look at the whole picture, which is we want people who graduate from here to stay, but we also want people growing up here to be able to get into post-secondary education. And what we've seen in recent years is a very significant drop. Uh, if you look at Alberta, BC, Manitoba, they've all seen a steady increase in the number of students from low-income families mm -hmm attending post-secondary education. That lowest quintile, the bottom 20%, is going up. In Saskatchewan, last 10 years, boom, it's just dropped way down. Why has it dropped down? Well, there's probably a number of factors, but one of the factors would be if you flip that chart, if you've got the image in your head, yeah. is what tuition has done. Right? Mm. It's, ri it's risen and risen and risen, and it's made it way harder for people to get in in the first place. So graduate is retention similar, programs are great. Is that, is that tuition piece similar in BC, Alberta? No, it hasn't ridden, risen anywhere near yeah. as much. We've gone from uh, you know, lower down to now the highest yeah. tuition in Western Canada, second highest in the country. And so right, right now we've got a program that's designed to give you money back if you get through school. but. That means you had to be able to yeah, afford to get to school place. in the first place, you pay for it in the first place. I'd put it at the front end. Same, same reduction in costs for those same people, but put it at the front end. Lower the tuition, uh, increase the grants available so that you get more people into school, and I think we'll still have just as many people staying. Because cool. it's not the it's not the graduate retention program that made it stay made people stay. It's that the economy was doing well, and one of the best ways to make sure your economy is doing well and is diversified invest in your universities. Mm. Cool. Well, thanks, Jamie, for that question, too. That was really yeah, good. That's really interesting. Okay, we'll take another one from the audience here. So it's uh, Rick. Rick says, does your plan for education include investing in more EAs to support the diverse needs found in every classroom and every school? And yeah, Rick, that is, I, I appreciate that question, Rick. Thanks, Rick. And I, I know there are uh, EAs out there watching who do incredible work from with uh, really young kids all the way up through the school system, and that's extremely important. That one-on-one -on -one attention means so much. Sometimes, though, I think we assign EAs who have somewhat less training to some of the more difficult kids and some of the, m the tougher challenges. And so we need to make sure that we're not putting EAs in a situation that's m too difficult for the training they have, that they've got enough support. And you know, sometimes we might need to have teachers involved in that role. We it's a bit of work to find the right mix. And uh, right now, we have not enough EAs, and maybe the, we don't have the mix exactly right. So let's come up with, in conversation with, with the whole school system, from, from kids to the school boards, 
the right balance. Well, and for those of you that know too, uh, the funding comes right now from the provincial government. School divisions make those decisions based on the funding on what EAs levels look like and things yeah. like that too. But in partnership with with the provincial government in in, in setting some standards, I guess too. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Rick. That's a good. One. Really important work. Yeah, it yeah. definitely is to support our teachers. So. Okay, this, uh, we have another prepared question. This is coming from grade 12 student Jack uh, from one of our local high schools here. Yes. Do you believe that stable and predictable funding to the K-12 education sector could help increase graduation rates and reduce the achievement gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students? Why or why not? Okay, well thanks Jack. We had Jill and Jack. <laughs> oh, I didn't even plan that. <laughs> you should have put them in the right order. Uh, okay, so the question around stable funding for education. Absolutely, that is something that we've seen eroded. We've seen this situation where people are getting surprise big cuts that make it really hard for school divisions and schools to, to plan for the needs that, that they have. And we talk about graduation rates and educational outcomes for Indigenous students in particular, you absolutely need to have stable funding if you're going to be able to respond to some of the higher needs that some students from those communities face. The other thing that I think is really clear is that we have an unjust uh, problem with funding for education here in Saskatchewan. And it's a, it's a problem across the country, but particularly dire in Saskatchewan where we have a very high percentage of our population is First Nations, is living on reserve. And that's a growing population. For us to have a situation where they're getting 30 to 50% less per student for their education, well, it's a recipe for long-term troubles for those individuals and for our province as a whole, as they're getting fewer opportunities. And it's just not fair. And you know, we, we've had statements from our premier and from our party saying we need to close that and advocating to the yeah. federal government. They haven't followed up, they haven't done it. And the Premier likes to keep picking fights with uh, Mr. Trudeau on, on various issues. This is the fight I think he should pick. If we're gonna pick any fight with the federal government, it's fighting for equal education funding for all students in Saskatchewan. And even though they're not coming forward with that payment right away, we should, as a province, put that payment in place, put that funding in place, and send the bill to Ottawa. Because it's costing us a billion dollars a year to our economy, and more importantly, as we've mentioned over and over, it's yeah. hurting those kids growing up on reserve right yeah. now. Uh, we can't wait five more years of uh, back and forth with the federal government. We need action now. So actually, for some viewers, if you don't know, Typically, well, not typically, the responsibility for education on reserves mm -hmm. is the federal government's responsibility, but our province can advocate and can, and as you said, could, could send that bill and fight for it. So. Exactly. And there's this, have you ever heard of the idea of Jordan's principle? Uh, remind me. Yeah, it's, it, it's this concept, and sorry to put you on the spot. No, no, that's fine. Um, it's this concept that came from a story in Manitoba, a young boy who was in hospital in Winnipeg and was in hospital his whole life, had a, had a serious disability, was okay. able to go home uh, and would have been able to go home, but the federal government and provincial government had a fight about who would pay for a ramp into the home. And as a result, he never actually left the hospital. He died in hospital when he could have spent some time no, with his family. And that really sparked a lot of attention and the development of a concept of Jordan's principle, which is in healthcare in particular, you pay for it first, and then you sort out who, who will ultimately foot the bill. You get the work done. And we need to apply that Because we're dealing with lives and it's people. And exactly. It's, yeah. And this jurisdictional wrangling and passing off the responsibility, it's just, uh, it's just costing us mm -hmm. more in the long run. So I'm being educated during these videos as well. Jordan's, learn from Jordan's other, principle, yeah. that's good. Okay, we're gonna go to another prepared question here. This one comes from, it is a, a grade two teacher in our system, uh, Jason. Jason's grade two question, or from grade two, sorry. <laughs> and my question is, the Saskatchewan K-12 education sector relies on partnerships. The SSBA, the STF, teacher associations, education sector labor groups, and the professional gov uh, provincial government. 
Do you believe any changes are necessary to this model? Would you do anything to enhance these partnerships? Thanks, Jason. And you talk about partnerships, and I, I think that's where we have to get back to is a true partnership. Over the last decade, we've seen an erosion in the relationship between the provincial government, the SSBA, STF, teachers and their organizations. That's a, uh, that's a step backwards for us. We cannot design the best education system and deliver the best education system with decisions being made by the Ministry of Education alone. And the movement in recent, and we've seen a few years ago where we lost the ability of local communities to set their mill rate so that they could adjust to changing needs, and now most recently Bill 63, which basically allows the government to uh, change any decision by a school board to really direct their activities entirely. These are backward steps, and they're steps that are based on a lack of respect for school boards, a lack of respect for teachers. We saw the uh, decision to push the teachers yeah. to take a 3.67 percent yeah. wage cut, uh, which is, you know, 3.5 is too much for anybody, and they're asking teachers even more. That shows a lack of respect for the importance uh, and the value of the work that teachers do. For us to chart the right path forward, we need to, as I mentioned earlier, establish a new process, get around the table with those partners, and work together side by side instead of uh, having this confrontational uh, distance between us. Cool. I love that. Uh, building the partnerships is extremely important. So. We can't do it without it. I appreciate that. Okay, we're going to go to another, uh, another prepared question here. This one comes from Bailey. She's another education student at the U of R here. And I was just wondering what aspects of the K-12 education program that you're proud of and what, challenge, or what aspects do you find challenging? This will be a tricky one. Yeah, that's a provocative <laughs> question. What do, you, what do you really like? What are you proud of? And uh, what do you uh, find challenging? Um, I, I, I'm a parent of a kid in the K-12 system. Mon fils il va à l'école canadienne française. Although he's, he's going to a uh, French school in Saskatoon. Um, I really love the, the attention that he gets from his teacher, the way that they have developed a really inclusive and welcoming school. And uh, I think that that's what's happening with schools around the province. Teachers, as we already talked about today, are facing bigger challenges. They're also meeting them. They're doing the work to make kids feel welcome and have the opportunity to succeed. So there's so much leadership, so many great examples within our system. The challenges, I think we've already uh, addressed. You know, we'll take one other, other example of something that I think is great, the treaty education, the way they've oh, integrated yes. that idea into uh, our education system that students should know our history, the history of colonization, the history of residential schools, and the treaty relationships. Um, but Even recognizing we're on Treaty 4 land as, as we film this, too, is, it, is important. Thing. Exactly, exactly. Recognizing with the treaty flag behind us that we're on Treaty 4 territory. And you know, recognizing the, the role of the Métis as well in our, in our society, our history, and our, our present day. Um, so that's wonderful. The challenge is, have we actually been able to give teachers the resources to do that well? Or are we saying, Teachers, you must teach this without actually giving the supports to, to help them to succeed in doing it. So I think that's a, that's a common thing is teachers are dealing with new ideas and, and yeah. uh, big challenges, but we need to make sure that they've got the support to be able to a deliver. training and that, yeah. that support. They want to do it, yeah. and we just want to make sure that they can do it the best possible. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks for the question, Bailey. So this one comes from the comments here. Uh, keep those comments coming. We'll try to get to one or two more here. Charmaine says, Ryan, what is your perspective on the current government's use of the notwithstanding clause to uh, defy a court ruling that said the government could not pay for uh, non-Catholic students to attend Catholic schools? This is a, this is a loaded one. Sorry. Yeah, that's a, that's a hot topic. You know, I think the, the use of the notwithstanding clause from everything I've been able to read, I'm not a constitutional lawyer by any means, but everything I've been able to read and understand is premature. That there's a, a case before the courts, that there will be appeals, that we don't actually need the notwithstanding clause at this time. What I think we do need is time to really understand what the higher courts will say 
and clarity on what the Constitution says and that we'll follow what the Constitution says and time if there does need to be a change to make an adjustment as you mm. can understand with a system that's been developed over uh, you know, 100 years we've got different buildings different mm. systems how how would we uh, uh, make changes we'd need time if there are changes to be made well and it's I know it's a complicated and it's a hot topic but for those of you that don't know the notwithstanding clause doesn't uh, strike something from law what it does is it holds that decision for five years, essentially, yeah. is what it does. It just presses pause. And, That's a and that great may way to be exactly yeah. what we need to do at some point. Um, I think the use of it at this point is more politics than it is actual practicality. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Charmaine, for that one. Uh, okay, I, got, uh, I was going to do a little bit of a quiz. Uh, let's, let's move on to uh, another prepared question here. So... <laughs> Alex's question, she's actually a grade 9 student and comes up with okay. a, she has a great question here. So, Alex, with your question. My question for you is, what other ideas do you have about helping the K-12 education sector achieve the best results for all Saskatchewan students, including myself? So, Alex's question, uh, Alex, I think uh, just how do you achieve those best results is a... Is yeah. a a and good one. I think there's, once again, we, we have to kind of go back to the whole spectrum from making sure that kids right off the bat, those first thousand days of life, have access to good early childhood education and that we are addressing, as Wendy brought up, the social factors, poverty, food security, good housing, that allow students to succeed. I see this in my practice as a, as a family physician, especially working in the inner city where I did. If kids are not able to have a safe place to stay, able to have access to healthy food, they struggle in school. They might show up to my office with a letter from their teacher thinking they need medications to help concentrate, which some kids do. But how do you expect a kid to concentrate if they're hungry or they don't have a safe place to stay? Moving up the, up the chain, high quality K-12 education with support for teachers to develop professionally and continue to learn how to perform in their role and then an equitable system making sure that we're responding to different needs and, and meeting the needs of the students that struggle most first and lastly just building that relationship and it uh, it might sound a bit repetitive but everything comes down to us being sitting down here together uh, having, that open, having these yeah. conversations over and over again I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, so we got uh, Shar says, uh, and this is so. This is an online question here. What do you envision in terms of an intersectional approach between health, justice, mental health, social services, etc., so that all students are helped in a more proactive and timely fashion? And great, great yeah, question. Terrific question. Um, a couple blocks from where I live and where I was practicing is St. Mary's School hmm. uh, in Saskatoon on the west side, and. It's a really interesting example where it's an elementary school but also has a clinic with a mental health focus right built in. Or there's the high school in Isla Cross that is actually built with the hospital and has a daycare in it and the public health facility in it. So I really love that idea of co-locating as much as we possibly can services that kids need from various sectors, justice, social services, health, right within the school system. And you obviously have to do that in a safe way so that you have the services that are just for adults, just for adults aren't uh, having people come into the school in and out. But anything that is for families, is for students, I think we can find way more ways of integrating, using our physical facilities better, but more importantly, putting everything in one place to help that kid. And that maybe as we talk about the overall vision for how do we succeed for kids, that comes back to another idea, which is the introduction of a ministry of the child. I don't uh, know if I've we've chatted it. about this one yet. I've heard but it yet. Yeah, it's Not today, but yeah. That's the, this idea that we have stuff for kids in justice, in education, in health, it's, and it's all a bit scattered. And it's siloed almost. It's, it's siloed, and it doesn't talk to each other. So you might have one kid accessing mm -hmm. a bunch of different sectors and them not talking to each other. So if we create a ministry of the child that helps to bring everything under one roof and really focus on the best outcomes for kids, that'll help us develop the best future for Saskatchewan. When I read that in your platform too, so I, uh, anyway, that's, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. That's, that's pretty neat. So, 
Okay, I, w I did want to do, I, this is about fun. So our, our, our okay. provincial okay. leaders, I, I, uh, I think it's, we can talk serious things in, about education, but I always like to have a little bit of fun. So I have uh, three jokes here. And as a doctor, I was hoping that you could finish these jokes off. So I'll give you the first part, we'll see, and we're gonna, we're gonna quiz you out of three. And okay. uh, you'll have bragging rights back at the ledge. Okay, so the first one is, uh, is and this is really testing your funny bone as well. So uh, when does a doctor get mad? When does a doctor get mad? Oh geez, I don't know. After. When he runs out of patience. Ah. He runs out of patience. Okay, <laughs> hey, these are bad. So yeah, if if I, you get these before Ryan, put your comments down there. I want to see if our audience yeah, can get them I, get them quick. I think my uh, my caucus colleagues will be a bit disappointed in me because I usually <laughs> fill the room with puns and here oh, I am a bit slow on them. Yeah. Okay, this one is uh, uh, where does a boat go when it's sick? Hmm. To the dock tour. Uh, to the dock, but yeah, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, that was yeah, good. Yeah. Close nice. right. That that counts. That counts as a point. Uh, okay, and then this one. Uh, why did the pillow go to the doctor? Hmm. Yeah, you gotta you gotta give me a hint here. My son laughed at this one, but he was feeling all stuffed up. All yeah. stuffed up. I yeah. thought that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. You got That's one. I, stuff. I'm impressed. Th those were, those I'm, were tricky. That's I'm a little disappointed in myself. <laughs> okay, before we go to our last prepared question, we have an audience question from Spencer. Uh, Spencer's question is, do you have a plan to facilitate trimming of class sizes to help improve quality of education? Do you see large class sizes as a serious problem? And certainly if, if class sizes are too large for uh, teachers to be able to provide that individualized attention to children, uh, to be able to identify when somebody's struggling or when somebody's really succeeding and needs a little bit of extra encouragement in something they're great at, uh, we have a problem. There's a bit of debate in the literature, and I don't know if you've looked into this. There's Malcolm Gladwell has a whole section in one of his books on how much class sizes really make a difference. And, and it seems like... Um, it's not as cut and dried as we might think, that the smaller, the smaller, the better, that there's maybe a, a happy medium yeah. that's, uh, that's really of high quality. And that's what I would say is, let's look to the evidence. Let's look at two kinds of evidence. One, what does the overall literature say uh, are the best class sizes? And two, what does our experience in individual schools and individual classes say about the ability for um, that that school to have the right sizes because a different uh, one teacher might be able to handle yeah. a larger class than another or one community might need uh, things done in a, a more smaller uh, smaller size or maybe they can handle a, a bit bigger and I think that's part of that conversation piece you mentioned about having those conversations you can't, you can't have absolutes yeah. and say it has to be between X and Y number uh, without actually being a bit responsive to what the day-to-day -day reality is. I know our division with the, the budget restraints this past year, I, I believe we went up just under one student, roughly one per teacher is yeah. essentially what the average went up to. It's not quite one, but it was just under that. So, okay. Um, yeah, it, it makes a difference, I think, in some of our classrooms. So. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Yeah. Okay, thanks for, the, thanks for that question, too. So this one, uh, we're going to go to a prepared question. This is actually from one of our Regina City Councillors. Uh, Andrew Stevens has, has a question for you, right? If you could do one thing today and cost was not an issue to improve the K-12 system, what would it be? Thanks, Andrew. Good to see you. Uh, one thing, cost not an issue. Oh, something we put out uh, that we haven't talked about today that we put out early on in our uh, policy was the idea of a school lunch program. We've seen over, uh, over the years in, in different schools and different uh, provinces and places that have tried that, it makes a real difference in kids' experience uh, to be able to have that school lunch or school breakfast and lunch if necessary. If cost wasn't an issue, we'd have it in every school. Cost probably is an issue, so I would start with the schools that are at the highest need, the highest risk and make sure that we're getting that healthy lunch there and pilot it there and then expand it as we're able to afford to. And as we, as we show that it actually pays for itself both economically and in terms of improving the lives of kids. So you heard it first. If we get a big 
bag of cash from the province. School, school. Uh, we'll have great lunches at school. <laughs> great lunches. I love it. That's great. Okay, well, thanks for the time, Ryan. I, uh, Thank I you, appreciate really having fun. the conversation, and uh, it's so important to continue this conversation on education, and it, it, the more that we, that we talk about it and discuss it, and the more that our leaders talk about it as well, I believe we will have a, a world, we already have a, a great system, but we can, do, we can do better. We have an amazing system, yeah. and I think our education system, being as it is, uh, people talk about we're one of the few places where Wealthy people send yes. their kids to public school. Yeah, and that's a good point. that means everybody is invested in a high quality school system. And the more we maintain that, the more we invest and we deliver on a high quality system, the less we'll have that pull towards people wanting to have more private schools and more charter schools, anything like that. Let's keep it public, keep it high quality, and that's how we keep it amazing for kids. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, right. and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. I want to thank you again for tuning in. And it's important to make your voice heard. One way to do that is to vote. The deadlines are a little different for each party. The SAS Party Leadership Convention is January 27th, 2018 at Prairie Land Park in Saskatoon. However, the deadline to purchase a membership and to be able to vote for your new party leader is December 8th, 2017. And the NDP Leadership Convention is March 3rd, 2018 at the Delta Hotel in Regina. The deadline to purchase a membership is January 19th, 2018. I would like to encourage you to share this post, hashtag it Premier Education, and make sure you click that you like the post as well. I want to further encourage you that if you found this valuable, like the at Adam Hicks Regina School Board page. Click on the like button. You can also ensure that you get new notifications coming up. Uh, so notifications for new videos, you click on following, you click on see first, and you click on on events and all live videos. So next time we have a live video, that'll be the first thing you'll see is when we're tuning in with a, a new candidate. Thanks a lot. Take care. The Premier Education Campaign is created by Adam Hicks trustee of the Regina Board of Education. The opinions expressed in this project do not necessarily reflect those of the Board of Education or Regina Public Schools.